Hi, my name is Phil and I enjoy talking about politics. And on the poll, the one you wanted to talk about today was what the UK is basically going to lose if it leaves the EU under no deal particularly and then chooses to rejoin at a later date. So the video is going to go through the advantages that we currently enjoy as part of the EU. Not the standard membership benefits because obviously we wouldn't lose those if we rejoined, we would regain them. We're talking about the freedoms that most countries in the EU don't have. Um, none of these are actually unique to the UK but all of them are uncommon and in some cases rare. And because the UK has more of these individual perks than anyone else, as far as I can tell at any rate, it could be argued that the UK doesn't just have the best deal already as being a member of the EU, but potentially the best deal of any EU country within the EU. Now, we'll start off with the rebate because that's the most famous, although I also think it's the weakest of the perks. And um, basically how it works out, it works out roughly two thirds of our net contribution to the membership. So that's after you've taken away, you know, subsidies, grants, things like that. Um, now, the rebate isn't just unfair because other EU countries don't get one. There are a couple of exceptions, but because they have to pay for it. Now, just to explain where the rebate came from. It occurred in the first place because we joined up. Um, we tended to have more of our trade outside the EEC. Now remember, the reason we joined in the first place was largely for the economic benefits. Britain has always tended to be quite standoffish about political benefits. It's tended to be about the economic benefits. So we were effectively paying for access to the single market. Now, the if you've got a lot more of your trade outside of the EEC, as it was at the time, than other nations within it, you could argue, well, hang on a minute, we're paying a premium um, because we don't use it as much as other people. Shouldn't we get a, a cheaper rate? So that was part of the argument. The other argument was that a lot of this money was being used to subsidise agriculture, as indeed it is in the UK. But the UK doesn't have a lot of agriculture. It's quite small, especially compared to a lot of other EU nations. And so again, we weren't going to be getting as much of that subsidy as well. Um, so it was just argued that we're not getting a huge amount of benefit and that's why the rebate was worked out. They said, fair enough. But the issue is that just as with parliaments in individual member states, the EU parliament has to set a budget. It, needs to, it decides how much it needs to spend and it sets a budget at that. And then that budget um, comes from the contributions from, from the various countries. And so when you're giving billions of pounds back to the UK, as well as a couple of others, then that means the other member states have to come up with the shortfall. They have to pay extra uh, to be able to cover those costs. Now, <clears throat> so now you've got a situation where from a normal EU citizen's point of view, they're thinking, well, hang on a minute. So you're saying that we're paying a higher membership to cover the rebate to the second wealthiest nation in the EU, and they're not even grateful about it. So you can understand why they'd be pissed off. And you can also see why if we tried to rejoin, that wouldn't wash, we wouldn't get that back again. Um, now, the thing is, saving billions of pounds for the UK might sound great for us. Uh, but the reason why I'm saying it's the least of the things we lose is we may have lost it anyway. OK, we haven't lost it at this point in time. But if you look 10 years in times, if we'd stayed in the EU in 10 years time, we may lose it anyway. Because the current feeling is that the rebates are no longer valid. You know, because you think to yourself, well, those reasons you gave for the rebate sound perfectly reasonable to me. Um, but, you know, the, the EU has moved on. Well, it's changed its name for a start. But it's moved on and it is considered that the rebates reasons are no longer so valid. There are moves to eliminate them altogether quite soon. Now, moves to eliminate them doesn't mean to say that that would happen, but uh, it's very likely to happen. Now, as such, for the UK to be able to keep that rebate then the government would have to be able to work some negotiating magic now does anyone really think that the same people who spent two and a half years technically two years but we started the process two and a half years ago informally at least coming up with no deal at all not even a withdrawal agreement do we really think that those boneheads would be able to work that negotiating magic and keep our rebate against the wishes of the rest of the eu I don't think so. I think that would take a special sort of genius. And genius is not the word I would attribute to our current crop. Um, 
But the rebate isn't the only exceptional perk. It's just one of the more famous ones. We also have a series of what are called opt-outs. We have four main opt-outs. So this is, you know, there are rules within the EU. And member states need to follow these rules, all part of political unity, all that. And we opt out of four of them. So one such opt-out uh, is the Schengen Agreement. Now, what that does is it suggests that borders between member states within the EU should be open. People should be free to travel across them. No problem. As if you're just traveling across county lines within the UK, for example. No problem at all. Um, you know, the borders should be open. Now, that's something that the Leavers keep suggesting is the case currently. Well, it isn't. The UK has opted out. So our borders are not open uh, between the UK and the EU, with the exception of in Ireland, where as a result of the Good Friday Agreement, there has to be an open border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. But beyond that, our borders are not actually open. Having said that, though, uh, and this is why I want to qualify that some of our, you know, benefits are not really benefits in the long term. If we did join Schengen, we would actually find travel between nations and therefore trade as well would run more smoothly. People within Schengen zones find it hugely beneficial. They don't consider it a bad thing. They think it's a brilliant thing. So although it's something we would end up losing on rejoining, uh, it would provide benefits. And after all, if the levers keep saying that our borders are open right now, then what do we actually have to lose by making it to be true? Um, the second thing, of course, relatively famous is the euro. The EU currency is something we also didn't join. We have an opt out for that. Good thing, too, you will argue, given what some dodgy nations, Greece and Italy, chief amongst them, did to Nakari. Oh, it was looking bad for a time, wasn't it? Uh, that being said, there are some who say that if the UK had joined, then we might have looked a bit more carefully about it and shone a light on the fact that maybe Greece shouldn't have been joining it, given that not only was there a hugely rampant corruption in terms of like paying huge sums of public money for, you know, you basically had cleaners being paid executive managers wages because it was the cousin of someone in charge, uh, as well as the fact that Greece as a nation has defaulted on its financial obligations, in other words, gone bankrupt, four times in modern history, you know. So some argue that maybe the UK would have looked at that and gone, uh, I don't think so. That being said, we don't know that. But naturally, the main objection in the UK hasn't been fiscal reasoning, but in losing the Queen's face from our notes. Ironically, there are some leave arguments that say we should leave the EU before its economy fails, even though there's no sign it's going to, because then that would drag us down. Whereas that's an absolute nonsense because our economy, our monetary system is not, our economy sort of is tied because we trade with them, but it would be outside as well. What I mean is the monetary system is not tied to the EU because we are not part of the euro. So it wouldn't actually harm our currency. Um, but if we had to leave and then rejoin, we would have to accept the euro, in which case our monetary system would be tied to that of the EU. Now, so far, most informed people would have been aware of those advantages. But one that is much less well known is our opt out from the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So the, the, e, the UK sorry, has negotiated an opt out on this so that basically European courts can't overrule UK law. OK, it can overrule British courts when it comes to the application of EU law, but it cannot overrule UK law. Of course, the EU legislates and member states are supposed to ensure that the European laws are consistent with their own. The UK and Poland, as it happens, opted out of this. Uh, it's another irony, really, that leavers sort of say that we have to accept EU laws and that we don't, we can't make our own laws. That's actually not true. The British Parliament enacts a law. That is a law. And the, the EU law can't trump it. Uh, the European courts can't say, no, you can't have that law. Um, that being said, if we rejoin, we wouldn't get an opt out of that. We would have to accept that EU law is king. OK. Um, it means that Parliament would only be able to enact laws that don't contradict EU law. Now, so far, you might, you know, and, and I understand it's easy for people not really to understand that this is a thing because there has been no friction with it. There has been no friction between EU law and British law for the simple reason, like I've said many times before, that the British government has been in favour of almost all EU laws. 
and the very few it hasn't been in favour of, quite frankly, we haven't chuntered and gone, oh, all right, well, we'll do it anyway. We've just ignored it. We wouldn't be able to do that either. Uh, finally, the final opt-out, the, the most boring really, but quickly, is the area of freedom, security and justice. So basically, it's um, a series of legislation which concerns access to justice, freedom of movement, extradition rules, policing cooperation across member states and other home affairs, things like that. Um, obviously, opting out of those helps criminals who operate across EU borders, makes it more difficult for the police to investigate an arrest. So ironically, on the issue of immigration, it actually helps people smugglers that we opted out of this because people smuggling people from between the UK and other EU member states, the police have a harder time in investigate, investigating making arrests because, you know, they've got to, uh, those borders are there. And it's very, it's much more difficult for cooperation. It's not to say we have no cooperation, but it tends to be on uh, on specific projects as opposed to more general co co um, cooperation with most EU member states, uh, where criminals wouldn't find any advantage in between locating in one member state and, and carrying out its crimes in another. Um, so for me, who's someone who's proud to be a member of the EU, especially on political grounds rather than just economic, I'd actually see it as beneficial to lose all of those opt-outs because I actually think we shoot ourselves in the foot by, by doing them. I know that they are seen as unpopular in the UK, but that's because we have this hugely xenophobic attitude uh, here and, you know, obviously fueled by newspapers. Um, but I don't see it as more power to our government to have these opt-outs. I see it as in ways in which we hamper the freedoms and wealth of our own population um, the ones obviously it would royally pissed off are the Leavers. Now, I know that the Leavers will say that the events that would lead us to wanting to rejoin, because think about what would cause this in the first place, especially if we're going to lose a load of these benefits. We would have to leave with no deal, and we'd be expecting that um, all the banks, all the businesses, well, not all the businesses, some say that they'd be quite happy without it, um, but should we say a majority of the businesses, but all the banks, and all the economists who say that in the event of a no deal Brexit, that our economy is really up against it and we're going to struggle. And in 10 years time, we'll be begging to get back in. That's that's the only thing that would cause us. We'd have to be desperate. All right. Um, because at the end of the day, it would be national humiliation. So we'd have to be desperate to knock back on the door and say, uh, excuse me, can we come back in? It's a little bit cold out here. Um, so, of course, leavers will say, well, that will never happen. Our economy will flourish. We'll be a beacon to the world again. Fine. But let's just say in some uh, fantasy world where all the experts actually know what they're talking about. Mad, I know. Uh, what I'd have to say is, just on a private note, and I know this is stupid and I shouldn't be doing this because it's cutting off your nose to spite your face. I have to say that I would have a little bit of quiet amusement in at that point wondering how all the people who pushed leave would be treated by their current support, current support, sorry, once they see that it will be their fault that we lose the pound, their fault that we lose control over our borders, because we currently do have control over them. We won't then. Uh, we lose our ability to enact any legislation that Parliament sees fit. It will have to make sure that it's consistent with EU law first. Uh, that we see our extradition procedures decided outside of the UK. And, and the people who banged on about sovereignty will actually have stripped a good portion of it away. But like I said, uh, no leave will accept this for now. That's fine, we'll just wait. In the event of a soft Brexit, of course, our form may be gentle enough that it never becomes an issue. At the end of the day, um, the, it's not the political benefits that we really see in this country anyway. It's the economic benefits. So in a case of a soft Brexit, economically we may be okay, in which case, all right. I will still miss the fact that I think we'll be poorer politically for it, but the, the majority of the population will be okay as long as we remain economically strong. Now, finally, there is the issue of the veto. Now, I've sort of left this to last here because technically we don't get an actual veto in terms of how you would understand the word veto, which is everyone agrees to something, you stand and say, no, 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 we're not having that. You know, as comes with being on the uh, UN permanent a permanent member of the UN Security Council, for example. Something else we may not retain <laughs> before long, but anyway. So we don't really get a veto in that sense. But what we do have is the power to block decisions on, say, taxation and foreign affairs 
Um, any changes to the constitution which might change the level of union in the, U in the EU could be blocked. So the people who keep complaining that we're headed to United States of Europe, which I don't mind too much about at all, because I don't think people really understand what they're saying when they say that. But anyway, those who are and they fear that are actually increasing the risk of it happening by leaving. Because at the moment, we, we could block that. Now, the reason we haven't is because actually all the increases in unionisation of the EU have been supported by the UK. In fact, more than supported. It's, you know, in the 80s, it's our government that actually suggested it, recommended it, pushed very hard for it. But if we leave and then rejoin, we don't likely have the same level of influence as the longer standing members. Um, and we'd find it harder, if not impossible, to block such measures, especially as at the moment, in fact, something in the news today about an uh, agreement between France and Germany. France and Germany are working very cooperatively in terms of being the engine of the European Union, something we should absolutely be doing ourselves. But even though our governments are in favour of being in the EU, again, it's always all about the economics and not so much the, the politics. And so even our pro-EU governments have tended to be quite aloof when it comes to Europe. So we're not really in the engine driving it forward. We're more sort of in the sidecar, you know, enjoying the ride. Um, but like I say, the vetoes are not nearly as strong as the word may suggest in the first place. You know, there are a number of things, as I say, we can try and block, but we can't unilaterally make it stick if the rest of the EU is dead set on it. Um, so a better word potentially would be influence. We have major influence to trip up um, a project if we are really against it, because it's quite likely we'll find some support. And we it's not a majority thing. We don't need, you know, half the people to be on our side. We just need a, enough to cause trouble on it. Um, so if we do leave the EU... We need to be sure that it is the right option because despite assurances that we could just rejoin if we don't like it on the outside, well, first of all, everyone would have to agree to that, but we wouldn't be able to rejoin on our current terms. In order to rejoin, there'd be certain requirements, um, including alignment of our currency, go buy, buy by the pound, welcome the euro, Schengen agreement, so then the Irish border won't be an issue at all, but by then, who knows? Um, but like I said, it's not all about loss if we were to rejoin. Given all the current benefits that would be denied to us, should we reapply in 10 years' time, we'd only do this if the situation became so bad that we'd accept anything. So at the time, we wouldn't really consider it, I suppose, uh, a great bind. It would just be, I suppose, sad for some people. But out of the humiliation of looking like a nation of Muppets, were this to pass, and I know leavers will say, well, it's not going to pass. All right. But were it to pass... We'd have learnt some humility, I think. That would be a good thing. We'd have maybe dropped the xenophobic attitude. That would be quite handy. Um, even woken up to the fact that we are no longer the mighty British Empire. We just happen to live on a very wet, windy and splintered island. Um, we might even decide to stop being so ignorant and teach our children to learn properly a prominent foreign language uh, and become so that our future generations can become bilingual in the way that many EU countries uh, also are uh, you know and that would be really positive as well that would be really positive for our economy apart from anything else it's very difficult to do business with people when you don't speak basic languages uh, we only speak one and we sort of you know we're a bit variable on that and if we're really lucky this is what I would hope most of all if we're if this was to happen if we were really lucky we might even turn on the people, the very people who condemned us to our fate. Corrupt media barons, politicians and wealthy party donors with disproportionate amounts of influence and perhaps the future Britain would involve the population demanding those who basically enjoy such influence to respect the fundamental British values that those people who fractured Britain in the first place passed onto the rest of us for the last few years. So there is that hope as well that we might actually change our attitude. And, and I know there's people in the EU, people put it in my comments, that think it would actually be worth us going out into the wilderness for a few years so we can actually face up to a few realities and come back. And I know there are some people who are saying, oh, well, the leavers will never accept. They'll just blame the EU. Even outside of the EU, it'll still be the EU's fault. Um, but I, I, the argument I come up with is I think to myself, although people 
can be fooled by political arguments and they can go along with political arguments if they're presented in a certain way. I think when people lose their jobs and they lose their homes, they lose their lives, their communities, I don't think there'll be too many people railing against the EU in that situation. You know, they'll be turning on those people who said we'd do better outside of the EU and they'll be saying to them, what are you talking about? And they won't be in any mood to just listen to them. Because those people saying how brilliant it would be to leave the EU will be the people who've cost those people their livelihoods. Someone pointed out in the comments today, and this is absolutely true because I've lived it's about a town called Grimsby, which is where I lived there for over 10 years. I'm still quite close to it now. It's a, it's a dock town. It's a fishing town. And as someone pointed out, most of our fish uh, is exported to the EU currently. I think it's about 86% of our uh, of British fish exported to the EU. Obviously, that would come down massively. But there are 50,000 jobs in Grimsby that are related specifically to exporting it to the EU. That if we didn't export fish to the EU at all, all of those 50,000 jobs would be gone. Now, we're not going to stop completely, but with the extra tariffs on it, um, and also, as I was talking about yesterday, the fact that we're, um, well, our British fishermen may not be that popular in Europe, but who knows. But certainly with the extra tariffs on it, it'll be much less competitive and, you know, we wouldn't be able to export as much. In that case, I'm not saying it'll go to zero, but it'll proportionally, some of those 50,000 people are going to lose their jobs. In a town like Grimsby, I have to say, for those who are not aware, it's not a town of opportunities, really. There isn't a lot, there isn't a lot of other industry you could move into. Um, it's not a rich town. To lose even 10,000 of those jobs would be devastating to the local economy. And, uh, and ironically, Grim I said this in the comment, ironically, well, they said it actually, Grimsby overall as a constituency voted leave. So you'd be talking about a town that voted to leave and if it gets its way, it will destroy its own economy. And I, I said in the comments, you could end up with a situation, and it's sad for me to say this, you know, having lived there for so long myself, that Grimsby may well be labelled the dumbest town in Britain as a result of that shot to the foot. But anyway, I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to give it a like. Subscribe for further content. Click the bell notification to be notified. Of course, I'd like to see your comments down below as well. Share with other people who may also be interested. And I will be putting a poll out as well again today. But this will be again for two days time. Because tomorrow, um, I'm likely to be talking about what Theresa May is going to be talking about this evening. Um, so, go to the poll. You can find that on the homepage. If you... If you subscribe and, and click the bell notification. You should get notifications of the new polls anyway, but it's in the communities tab on the homepage. So until next time, I'll see you later.